excellent, all the more I'll project. That picture of me, by the way, that one, was from the last time I spoke at the Spoke National Conference, was on that day. So it's actually quite amazing how much has happened between then and now. So thank you so much for having me here. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you, Antonia. Uh, thank you, all my friends who are part of Spock. And I have had the privilege and honor of, of being, uh, kind of getting to know so many people uh, from different Spock chapters around the country uh, in the last few years. So I'm really honored uh, to be here on this stage today um, on, on the, this particular day that you're having your conference. So the one thing I have to say before I even start is um, this talk is a little different because I am going to do something that I have never done before. Anyone who knows me knows that I, I talk a lot. <laughs> but because it's about the hidden horrors of what reproductive rights groups and organizations are doing in Africa, some of it I can't really explain just by a PowerPoint presentation. So for the first time ever, well, I've done something similar once before in America, but this one, I've put a long video inside of this talk. So uh, it's seven minutes long. <laughs> so I'm sorry you, you think you're going to hear me speaking a lot today. It's probably that you're going to be watching a video. Uh, it's like kind of getting children to, to keep quiet. You say, I'm going to put a video for a child, getting the child entertained. So I've put seven minutes in here. Uh, please do indulge me. Please do watch it if possible. Uh, listen to it's just a series of interviews, but I will explain to you exactly what was going on. Uh, so, so the presentation. I've had some technological challenges today. Is it? Where is the slide? Where are the slides? <laughs> I can see myself. <laughs> So I'm supposed to be controlling it from here. That's another thing. So I don't have a computer. Oh, I might be able to see it from here as well. So the hidden horrors of reproductive rights organizations in Africa. When I was preparing this uh, presentation, I had just one organization in mind. And I just say it from the get-go. It's Mary Stokes International. Um, but I, so I wanted to say the hidden horrors of Mary Stokes International work in Africa. Then I thought to myself, what if Catherine Hampton puts the topic online and then someone from Marie Stokes because they keep trolling Spock because they're afraid of Spock and then they see it, then they come here uh, and they try to cause problems. So I said, no, I will code it, okay? So, <laughs> so it's a code, all right? So it's uh, the, the reproductive rights and organizations, but Marie Stokes is one of the main organizations that is causing a lot of problems in Africa. Uh, my particular interest with it, of course, is for two reasons, because one, I live in the United Kingdom, and of course this organization has originated from this country, but two, I'm African, and they are in Africa. So they, I know them here, what they are doing at home, in their home, and I'm wondering what are they doing in my home, right? And this was my interest and my fascination with Marie Stokes International, that's why I started following them uh, a few years ago to know a bit more about their work. So it's really a lot about them, but just so you know, they do have other people that they are linked with, you know. Um, people who do, just like people who do good work, or, you know, organizations that do good work find themselves linking up to collaborate to do different things. Marie Stokes, even in Africa, they do a lot of collaborative work with American organizations like International Planned Parenthood Federation and the others, but they are the main ones and the main subject uh, in this particular presentation. So. Uh, I'll start from the very beginning to say that Afri the, the, we do have something I call the African dynamics. Because uh, why Africa is in the position it is to, it, today in the first place is because of all the things happening at the same time on the continent of Africa, where there are, of course, all of you know, 54 countries. Um, and it's usually when I'm speaking in America, I like to point this out, but the British people are so intelligent. You guys are so intelligent. I don't have to, right? <laughs> but for the Americans, I do have to say, even though I love the Americans too, but you know, you have to say it's not a village. Africa is not a village, it's 54 countries. So it's 54 countries. 
countries and, and here are the dynamics affecting on so many moving parts. And uh, we, we have uh, problems with our economy, of course, there's all these things happening where the different African countries are trying to, to bring about economic growth. We have problems with our politics, we have security issues, everybody has heard of Boko Haram. We have infrastructure issues. Um, there are places where you go to, there are, there are no roads, there are places where you go to, you don't have good water or good clean drinking water. So we have all these issues. We have development issues. Uh, healthcare is also a problem. So each of these would represent uh, just a weakness and a vulnerability for the African people. So because we have found ourselves, let's say since the end of, of colonization, so since the days of independence, so from like the 1960s, Africans have been, different African countries have been grappling with one or some or all of these things. Some countries have done better than the others, but this is what has been lost. Uh, and this is why it seems to see the Africans are always in need. They're always in need of donation. Every time something uh, you're watching something on television and there is going to be a one minute break for some kind of money appeal, I will bet all the money I have, and I don't have a lot of it, that it will be Africa to be someone begging for money for food for children or something. So these are all the issues that make us very weak. But then, uh, there enters our saviors, the donors. Uh, and these donors are really awful. And this is what they come with that is so appealing to the African government and African leaders. The pounds, the dollar, the euros. This is the price at which we are being sold off, uh, partitioned and annexed uh, by different people who are coming from different places. And some of them are actually nations, uh, bigger, wealthier nations. Some of them are organizations. And some are private foundations. All say that they mean well, all come as if they, all they want is to see an end to poverty, an end to this and that. Of course, of course, of course, in all of this, I am not saying that they haven't done some good. I am not saying that it's bad to give food to children in Africa or water or, you know, all these things. I, I do understand the, the need that we have, the, 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 the need we have and the help that we need. And that's why I always start off saying, just these are the, weakness, the weaknesses and the, the weak spots that Africa has. But a lot of these people in recent years, in addition to all that, you know, all those, as you saw, all the major problems I listed uh, are generic things. You know, it's economy, there's politics. There's, but then the, these people, the donors, have focused on one issue that is of such great interest uh, to them. And that's what they call population assistance. So they give us foreign sector, what they call foreign sector, foreign uh, social social sector uh, foreign aid. So they have imagine there's a, the aid package, and then it's fragmented into three or four pieces. But the the largest amount of money that they give us comes under what they call the social sector, and this will include things like um, government. And, social, and civil society, water and sanitation, education also comes under that, healthcare comes under that. But this is the one that has now fascinated them. This is the one they're putting so much more effort into. And for years, I sort of kind of knew that. And of course, when most of us who are in pro-life work, uh, will. You suspect that, don't you? But I'm a scientist by profession, and I do not like conspiracy theories, uh, but I, I, I kept thinking, I wish I could get them. You know, I wish I could see where it's happening that the United Kingdom, for example, is giving money to African countries, more money to African countries for population control. You know, we hear these things, and we, we do want to believe, because we see it's happening, but we cannot tra trace it or track it. Today, I will give you uh, all the evidence you need to throw in the faces of people who tell you that you are being con you know, a conspiracy theorist by saying that the United Kingdom is so much more interested now in population programs. And of course, just so you know, because I'm sure you already know, that, uh, other population programs will come things like abortion and contraception. So, <coughs> so this is what happened. Um, 
So I, I am writing a book, and it, it took me a while to say that just now, because I'm not sure whether to say it or not. I have been writing a book for a few months. Some of my close friends here know that, for Ignatius Press. Uh, so do pray for me, okay? So in writing this book, I had to do a lot of investigations and a lot of um, uh, kind of fact-finding. I've been on a fact-finding mission, just going through. Okay, <laughs> false alarm. Okay, just going through um, lots of lots of government documents, lots of uh, budgets and such and such. So I needed to, to put a, a real reference, you know, and to track this down. And so these are things that have come from the book. And so you are the first people I'm sharing the information with. This is the 2014 uh, social sector allocation um, and how um, money has been allocated. You know, to those things I told you, the government, uh, water, sanitation, education, healthcare. So the, really the biggest uh, funding, foreign aid that we get. And this is from 2014 and I had to go find it uh, from the ODA people, the Official Development Assistance. So this is really buried deep uh, in the uh, kind of the, uh, the websites and the, the, uh, all the data that is collected by these organizations that, that track these things, but they don't really, they're not really interested in, in sharing it with people. So it will not come out in the news, but I needed to track it down. And these are all the countries uh, that give to Africa. This is just for Africa, right? Um, and you can see there's people from Australia, Austria, Belgium, Canada, but right at the very end, the last three, just look at the last three bars. The first, the first of those last three is United Kingdom, so that's you. Um, and then there's the United States, then there's EU, okay? So I know it's kind of meaningless to you, so I will break this down. So I took the liberty of removing everybody else, and that's what it looks like. Okay, so I'm just so you know, you don't, don't bother about Australia and Canada. Just look at yourselves. <laughs> I left America there just because I know it's always nice to uh, compare the UK and America. They, they do things a lot similar because if you see those two bars look almost identical, and you're wondering what is the red, what is the green, what is. So here is what that means. The purple is education, okay? 4.3 of what the UK gives us is on our education. And America is 4%, right? Uh, then the, the yellow is healthcare. So all the way down there is healthcare, okay, from the bottom. Then that large red, population programs. The UK, 43%, 43.8% of everything the UK gave us in 2014 was for population control. 31% of everything America gave us was for population control. Mind you, it's going into the same wallet. Um, the green is for government, so just a little for government and civil society, and the dark green is for other social things, 1.1, and then of course America didn't give us anything for that, but just so you compare uh, by the way, the health care was 5%. So when they tell you we really care for the African women dying in childbirth, but then they are giving more uh, 43 versus 5%. They are giving so much more to stop African women's fertility than to even help the women who are delivering. So women are dying in childbirth, and so what we're going to do instead of if we want to give anything at all, which of course I'm against some of this foreign but that's another, another talk. But if you must give something, uh, why, please, why give it to population control? Or why give it to stop those women even getting pregnant in the first place? But this is from their own documents showing how they have spent uh, your money uh, with regards to Africa, and I bet you even the most pro-choice people in this country need to have this information. Because this is quite sobering, and I think it's quite shameful. This is another way of interpreting it. This, this also came from them, but this is over the period of time. So from 1996 to 2013, even someone who does not know statistics or mathematics, please look at the red line. 
and see that population was the, the smallest amount of money given to us in 1996, you see how it's rising? As of 2013, population control is the largest amount of money being spent on Africa by anybody. I think this uh, is, is so shameful and scandalous that even the African people should be up in arms about this. And the British people and the American people, and now the Canadian, the new government, who are being made to pay for this objectionable, uh, this sort of objectionable waste of money. People should really take it up with their government because this is exactly what is coming into Africa in your name. So, uh, the organizations that are involved in the so-called population programs, so we pro-life people always call it population control. And you know, it's like when you say pro-abortion and then you are speaking in public and people try to blame you and they say, why call them pro-abortion? Why don't you just call them pro-choice? You know, that's what they want. So population control is one of those terms, you know, that when we say population control, we know exactly what we mean. But it was quite fascinating that when I was reading through their own documents, they were calling it population program. So that's very close, right? So even that doesn't sound good. So population control, uh, population, <laughs> population program, so-called population programs has a number of people involved with it. There's UNFPA, which is the United Nations uh, Population Fund, which is this arm of the United Nations. Uh, they are not a good organization at all, and um, Patrick, Patrick Buckley would, would tell you that. I, I have been at the UN with Patrick a number of times, and one of the organizations or agencies at the UN that is always a cause of grief for all of us is UNFPA. So whenever they're having meetings or events, uh, we try to be there. Uh, earlier this year, I was at the, the ICPD, the International Conference on Population and Development, which is once a year, and that's where they go to speak about all the population things they want to do. Uh, so it's, it's a horrible organization, and they're very much operational in Africa. There's IPPF, there's IPAS, these are all uh, abortion-type organizations. IPPF, of course, everybody knows that Planned Parenthood, if, if you didn't know. IPAS is less known in the Western world, but they are an American organization that is now highly operational in Africa. They don't provide abortion, but they lobby, which is so, so much, you know, so let's just say it's the same, right? They, they go into our African parliament and they are speaking to parliamentarians. They are just doing their horrible work trying to get African nations to uh, legalize abortion one after the other. There is PSI, which is the Population Services International, I think, and these ones are really big on condoms. So these are the kind of people who receive the money, okay? so. Uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, everybody knows them. They, uh, they don't re so much as receive that population program money, they give into the system. So I was again trying to travel where and how uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have been putting money into the population program because in 2012, those who know me know that how I came into pro-life work was because I wrote the open letter to Melinda Gates, of course, and that was how God brought me into this movement. Um, but the, by 2012, uh, Melinda Gates came out and made her announcement like they hadn't been doing enough or they hadn't really been involved in the population programs, and now let's just let's just give women contraception. So in investigating for this book I'm writing, uh, I went as far back as 2002, uh, just looking who's been giving money. But it so happened that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation every year give on the average about 80% of all the population money when it comes to the foundations and organizations. So they give more than everybody else. So I went through about 16 documents and I added up every place I saw the, the money. It was not easy. Uh, but it so happened that as of 2012, when Melinda Gates launched her massive, massive uh, campaign, which I, I, well, I take it as an attack against African women's fertility, uh, they had spent 3.6 billion pounds, uh, 3.6 billion dollars on population programs. 3.6 billion, and all she just wanted 
by starting off her campaign in 2012 was really to get people uh, to join them on, in something, in a project they had already been doing for so long. And of course, the Clintons are there and they are becoming very big players as well uh, because their foundation, they're very stingy, but they do receive a lot of money from the government. I don't know what they do with it, but, <laughs> but, but they, they're recipients. The Gates are also the givers. So these are people who are involved, but then also our favorite, the Marie Stokes International, uh, that they exist in 16 African countries and they're doing all sorts of horrible work. So those are really the, um, the population program people. Now this is an example of what falls under population programs. This was something that happened in 2015. Uh, Uganda had a, uh, there was a, an, an event I heard that was happening in Uganda. It was the Ministry of Health had put out a guideline on reducing unsafe abortion. But when, when I got this document and I opened it, it actually was on promoting how to give safe abortion. So this was an abortion document. But why it, it caught me, or why it caught my interest, was that abortion up to today is not even legal in Uganda. So why is the Ministry of Health launching this program? So I ran out and I, I picked up this document, it was sent to me, then I, I started studying it. And yeah, and that's what I saw on the last page. Sorry, it's too tiny, but I'm going to show you what's there. It's in the, right at the very end of the booklet. Um, that's what's written the stakeholders, the stakeholders meeting, and who's part of the stakeholders? The Center for Human Rights and Development. Ah! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that was instinct. UNFPA, you said UNFPA. So what are they doing in Uganda as stakeholders? Are they stakeholders in, in, in Uganda? USAID, which is the, the government agency for United States. IPAS, with the same organization. Uh, World Health Organization and Maristops Uganda. So all these people I have highlighted, right? Um, so they are supposed to be stakeholders in something that the Ministry of Health was doing. What had happened in truth was that these people were paying and bankrolling this event, and they went out to a hotel, a nice hotel in Uganda, and they were speaking to the other people who are not highlighted. Most of them are from the Ministry of Health, the members of parliament. This is happening in Africa like almost on a daily basis. So I took this document and I uh, started bothering the president <coughs> of the bishops' conference in Uganda. Uh, I was calling him on his mobile phone like every day. <laughs> and I was going to come and tell the bishops about this document because I had read it. Like, you need to see my copy of this document. It's highlighted and the real copy, the hard copy, is 56 pages. It's highlighted, like every place they describe how to do an abortion. So I told him, I need to come in when you are all together and I need to speak to the bishops and, and tell them the dangers of this and tell them to fight this. So very fortunately, he gave me last year uh, when they were having their meeting in June of last year, and I went out and I gave the bishops a half an hour uh, presentation on this particular document, and it was really wonderful uh, because they were quite outraged by it. But that's population. So we just zero down on, on Marie Stopes uh, International, and and really some of the some of the hidden, uh, more like in the hidden records and data, right? Uh, they get grant income from British government. Um, in 2011, they got 13.5 million pounds. That's what they got from the government. In 2012, it increased to 21 million pounds. In 2013, they got 27.5 million pounds. Someone is doing some, you know, someone is doing some lobbying because every year it seems as if they keep adding money. That's what they got in 2014. And that's what they got in 2000. So what I did there, right? It's like small funds, bigger funds, bigger funds, bigger funds, and then big funds, right? Just to show that they have uh, been working on the British Parliament or DFID and DFID keeps increasing their money because it's all coming under this population program. And 46% of all that funding is coming from the British government. 
So if the British government, for example, will just stop funding them, uh, Maristos will, will completely have to fold up. They will not be able to function. Because Americans have taken their money, by the way. So this year, next year, they're going to get a lot less money than they had because Americans were providing 23% of their funding. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was providing uh, 12% of their funding as of 2015. So if we can get the British government to say, you know, 46% were taken away, um, this organization will exist no more, at least as, as we know it in Africa. And this was why, when I had this thought, eureka moment, I decided uh, that I was going to, to, to follow, you know, just follow that train of thought if we can get it, if we can get them defunded. So, this is where the UK government stands on abortion. They released in 2010, I know that's a, that's a recent, that's a 2014 version, but this policy came up in 2010 when they decided on, a, on this safe and unsafe abortion. This was a policy by DFID. And this is what is inside it. The UK government basically is ready to fund abortion organizations overseas, unlike the Americans now with the Mexico City policy to say, if you provide abortion or you promote abortion, we will no longer fund you. So the British government has made a strong stand that to them, if an, if an organization is an abortion organization, we will, we're ready to fund you. They are even ready to fund abortion services. They are even ready to fund abortion lobbying. And this is what gets me. This is what actually enrages me because uh, a year ago I went out to Sierra Leone <coughs> because they're trying to pass an abortion law out there. They have already passed the bill. It has not been legalized, thank God, because the president listened to the, to the religious leaders and he decided he wasn't going to sign that horrible bill into law. So I, uh, I went out to Sierra Leone. I spoke to some politicians and, and some religious leaders. And I got to find out that Marie Stokes uh, was one of the organizations out there giving money, giving money to politicians. None of them, of course, will speak on record, but they are getting money. And where do you think that money is coming from? It's coming from DFID. That money is part of the 46% of funding that they are getting from DFID. And we need, we need it so desperately to be taken away because Marie Stokes is killing uh, Africa's unborn children. So this gets me and this makes me to lose sleep at night. Because each time I remember that because of a UK policy, government policy, uh, children, literally children are being killed. On what children are being killed in Africa? So this is really the base of my work and that's uh, just how I'm going to play this seven minute video and we're almost done. So can we um, just play the video? Oh, before you play, just give a second. Sorry. The video. It's part of the project, a larger project I had done earlier this year uh, called Killing Africa. So because of all this talk that I've shared with you, that I saw that Maristo was doing horrible work in Africa, then I thought, the British government is funding them. So if I can do something, if I can expose them, if I can go to Africa and try to find someone to speak to me about Maristo on camera, then I can come back here and, and release the video. And I did. So this is part of the interview I had most of it, anyway, uh, was an interview I had with a girl who had worked for Marie Stokes in a clinic in Uganda where abortion is not legal. Then there is just a very tiny part of right at the end was the video that I had got this year because I went out to Ethiopia and I spoke to a surgeon who had also seen girls that were harmed by Marie Stokes. So. Here is a short video clip of Paul Cornelison, Marie Stokes program director from South Africa, speaking about how Marie Stokes provides illegal abortion all over the world. He said this at a conference in London back in 2007. As you will see in a moment, the situation in 2016 is still the same. And, uh, and, and then there's various options, you know, once, once we open the center there, uh, I mean, uh, we do illegal abortions all over the world. And in a way, in a way, we, we can help people, you know. We just over the over the over the border from Johannesburg to Pretoria, we can even 
women with big need, you know, try and find a way to commute them backwards and forwards. There are various things we can look at if we can just put our, get our foot in the door there. We spoke to a young African woman, a nurse, who had worked for Mary Stopes International in the western region of Uganda. Some viewers may find her description of Mary Stopes' abortion practices very disturbing. I entered thinking it was uh, a family planning organization. But they disguised that and through the induction it becomes different and it's all about abortions. And it's good to point out once again that abortion is not legal in Uganda. So what did you think when you saw this? It was a blow. I didn't think there was an organization that was going against the rules of Uganda. I also didn't think that it would be that gross that someone, an organization, would think about abortions. I thought they would uphold lives. It was a surprise. As much as Maristot disguises as doing post-abortion care, right. it does real abortions. Because I've looked at their website, it's hard to tell in some of the countries where abortion is not legal. They never really write it clearly. What you are telling me now from the inside, what you saw was that they, girls came to them and they were offering abortions from beginning to end. That's very true. You had your induction and then you went to your center yes, to manage. I did. And this center was in what region? In Hoima, southwestern region of the country. But people came in. Was this a busy center? Was it a small? Was it... it was a busy center, but the most clients that came in were abortion clients, really. Most women of all ages, but mostly young women, young girls actually, young school girls. going girls. Mm -hmm. Underage young girls? Sometimes yes. 16? Sometimes yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. So these could have even been girls maybe who were exploited sexually. Were there any questions asked before any abortions like, who got you pregnant or are you in trouble or have you no. been raped? No. Uh, the main motive was uh, doing the act, the abortion, the service was abortion, the service was not finding out who or no where. No questions asked. No, no, no. So anybody can come in on the same day and get an abortion on that yes, day? Yes, they can. Yeah. There is no time to think about it, they don't give you time to think about not it? Not at they all. Don't. Do they ever tell people other options like adoption or, or do they ever offer any other kind of help that any woman can use if she didn't want to have an abortion? There is no help. The service is an abortion. I think in Maristop you would rather lose a family planning client than lose an abortion client. Please explain this. Uh, abortion, it's the core business. It's more important to them than I used to see family planning be important anyway. At the end of the month, there is a projection for how many abortions has been sent down. So the client has to be convinced and you make sure the abortion is done. Anybody ever cry or anybody ever say? Oh, they cry all the time. The, the procedure in itself is painful. They make so a lot to of talk noise. about some of the procedure, at least as much as you can, that you know and you're comfortable to talk about. What happens then when it's time? They go into the abortion room. Yes. Um, all that is there as a silencer is a loud radio, really. A radio is there. A radio. The There's room. a radio as the girl continues to cry and shout, and the radio is also increased so that it distracts the outside, the outside, from the inside. And who is there with the girl? The medical officer. The the it's clinical officer. Two people or who? There is a clinical officer doing the procedure, and the nurse is here talking to the woman to distract her from the pain. That is here on on the head side. And she keeps on distracting, asking the girl, how are you, where are you coming from? So she gets distracted from the pain. And the clinical officer is acting on the client and doing the abortion. And the medical officer is a doctor or not a doctor? He's a, he's a medical assistant. So a medical assistant is the one doing performing this abortion? Yeah. So this is also good to, to clarify that Marie Stopes, in this, at least while you were there, as far as you saw, they were not even using doctors to perform abortions. No, they, they mean, don't use doctors. Abortions are not even legal. No, they don't use doctors. A doctor is at this is works with family planning procedures. 
They use manual vacuum aspiration. So MVAs. MVAs, yeah. It's a very painful procedure, by the way. It's a painful procedure? Yes, it is. They, they cry, they scream out loud. And when they do, what happens? The radio is increased to distract the outside. So while this is going on, the girl is screaming oh, in yes. the abortion room. Oh, yes, she is. And the radio is increased louder. Yeah. Wow. This is incredible. And this happens routinely. This is not just one girl. This is for many of the girls that come through. Yes. So they do this suction aspiration. And then what care does the girl get afterwards? Painkillers and antibiotics. And then she's sent home the same day? Same day, same time. And then what happens to the baby's remains? They're disposed of. How does Marie Stokes, at least the center that you worked in, how did they dispose of, of the fetal and baby remains? Before 14 weeks, flushing toilet. After 14 weeks, pit latrine. Every time? This is like routine? Yes. And who does it? The staff? The people who perform this abortion or what? The person who performs the procedure, I think it has become normal to them. They are trained, Marie Stokes trains them. Yes. They are good at what they do. They are good at what they do. So they are good at performing these abortions and flushing down the baby's remains. Yes, they the are. Mm -hmm. And you also said this is up to 14 weeks pregnancy. And this is more than three months pregnancy, by the way. And they also perform abortions after 14 weeks. Yes, sometimes they do. As per Mary Steps guidelines, they are supposed to do an abortion up to 14 weeks. But according to their projections, if a woman walked in at, I think, five, six months, they still do this abortion using Mary Stokes medical procedures. And then how do they dispose of these dead babies? Pit latrine. So they throw the baby in the... Like wow. What a desecration. What a desecration yes, of, it is. of human remains. What a desecration of human remains. That's why I couldn't, there was no way other than just for, just for you to listen to it yourself. Because I, I had wanted to, I didn't want to add a long, long video in this presentation, but I just felt this is the only way. So when I did this video, I was so sure that this was going to be the end of at least British funding to Marie Stokes and by extension the end of Marie Stokes work especially in Africa because obviously well the, the question I was asking myself is surely the British government will not want to fund an organization that was performing illegal abortions in Africa breaking the laws of another country I mean there's so much involved in it that Nigeria surely will not be paying an organization to, to do things in the UK that are considered illegal. And abortion is really, really serious deal in Africa, right? It's the Africans so value human life and so believe in the personhood of the child in the womb that I was thinking, well, the UK government will have to choose between offending African countries and funding this horrible organization. That's what I thought. So when I released the video in January, a lot of people saw it, especially, well, pro-life people were very receptive to it. So a pro-life person wrote to the MP and questioned the MP on this video and said, we, you should find out what's happening with the funding. So the MP then wrote to Priti Patel, who is in charge of, of DFID, who is funding Marie Stokes, and um, we got a response. So because this guy got the response and sent it to me. Um, I have uh, removed his name, obviously, but this response came on the 27th of February, and I'm just going to, if you can't, I'm going to read what, it, what the ones I underlined. It's a very long letter, of course, as you would expect, but they said that uh, I understand these allegations are categorically untrue. This is what Pretty Patel says, and misleading, okay? Uh, she said they had been a Ugandan, they've gone to Ugandan court, uh, that's another thing altogether. This girl that I interviewed, this courageous woman, Desire Kirabo, she actually took Marie Stokes to court. This is the first time I ever heard of That's how I heard of her. Never heard of someone in Africa taking Marie Stokes to court because these are giants. No one ever challenges them. 
We cannot take pharmaceutical organizations to court in Africa. We can't take an organization like Marie Stokes to court. But this girl took them to court because they sacked her eventually when she started to complain about these illegal abortions. Uh, and then in court, by the way, she won the case. But it was a civil matter, and Marie Stokes was asked to, to compensate her, I think, some like two million shillings, which is, is not an awful lot of money, but it was compensation, and she really won that case as a civil matter. But the judge said in her statement in court that uh, there is no other proof of abortion, whether, whether the abortion was done or not, she doesn't know. The judge, this female judge was saying, because obviously no video was made, it was her word against Marie Stokes. However, the judge still went ahead and made sure this girl won the case because she said that everything Marie Stokes described about her being lazy and all the things, she just didn't buy it. So I read, uh, the, I read a, a statement directly from the court that I got from the court myself in Kampala, uh, and Marie Stokes then went to Diffie and said to them that, uh, that the, this was what was, so they just underlined where the judge said, there is, no, there is no real evidence one way or the other that abortions were being done, and this was what Preeti Patel used to judge my video. So she says it's just one person, it's misleading, it's categorically untrue. All of, all of our reviews demonstrate uh, confidence in the quality of Marie Stokes International Service. No issues have been identified, she said, that have raised questions. So she saw all these things in the video, and she still said nothing has been uh, no, no issues, no questions. Oh, did I miss something? <laughs> Sorry. Let's see. So that's the second page of her letter. And you can see her signature there, Pretty Patel. She says, um, UK can consider support of activities for activities to improve the quality, safety, and accessibility of abortion services. So she you know, rambles on. Then she puts her signature. So when I saw this response, it was very painful. That was in February. You know what I did? I emptied my bank account and I decided I was going to go back to Africa. And this time, I'm coming out with a new documentary early next year that does not have one interview. It has 15 interviews. 15. So I have things coming from Kenya, Nairobi. I have things from Maristo staff that isn't desire another person in Kenya who talks about Marie Stokes and how they performed abortions in Kenya, where abortion is also illegal. I also have uh, witnesses who have actually had their abortions in Marie Stokes. And we are going to take this to the British government and ask them to look at the African women who are crying from their regret of abortion that was performed by Marie Stokes, that was the money for which it the money for which uh, these abortions were done was provided by the British government. I would like them to tell these African women that we have absolutely no complaints about Marie Stokes.
when she was still pregnant, she said she had gone to Maristos, but uh, no, later on the sisters came and took her away. And then they told her to go for a scan, then she was going to have twins. And she said to me, I will not allow Maristos to take my babies. Right? I will never allow Maristos to take my babies. Then she had her babies, and then she sent me pictures, a girl and a boy. Uh, then this was another girl who was raped in Ghana as well, and she had her baby. Uh, but just such a joyful girl. And this is also for us to always remember that we do pro-life work. We, this is human rights work that we make sure no, no baby is left behind. That even in rape cases, we remember that no woman can ever be healed by the killing of her child. So we remain there and continue to speak at the top of our voices that we, will, we were there for every child. Not some, not maybe the ones that are perfect. We are there for everyone and we're not leaving until they let us save all those babies. So.